asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. You know all about Dean by now, a geopolitical analyst. Uh, you will see Dean popping up on uh, talk shows all around the world, providing shrewd and brilliantly briefed analysis on the events that we talk about on programmes like this. He's a former Democratic congressional nominee as well, don't forget that. And he's written some absolutely brilliant books which we've discussed on the programme before. And that's not sick of fancy. These books are outstanding. Check them out at his website. It's hendersonlefthook.wordpress.com hendersonlefthook.wordpress.com He's live today from Missouri. Let's welcome back our friend and colleague Dean Henderson. Dean, thanks for taking the time today. How are you? I'm great, Richie. Thanks for the kind intro, and I always enjoy talking with you, my friend. Thanks for coming on, Dean. Just two years ago, when the Chilcot Report published its findings into the run-up to the Iraq War, it was very critical, obviously, of decisions made by Tony Blair and all the rest of it. But, but shortly after that, journalists from around the world, including New York Times journalists, Journalists here in the UK, Telegraph, Guardian, Daily Mirror, they apologised profusely for letting people down and for not stopping the war path based on the pack of lies that was weapons of mass destruction and all the rest of it. And some of them assured us, Dean, that they would never let us down again. But as I look at the newspaper headlines today from the Chicago Tribune, from the New York Times, from USA Today, from the Daily Mail in London. It's like deja vu all over again, Dean. What do you think? Yeah, it sure is, Richie. And, you know, let's remind folks that it was British intelligence, the MI6, that gave the CIA the information saying that Saddam Hussein had this yellow cake uranium, which turned out to be false. So we have to remember that because, again, in the situation with Shripal in Salisbury in England, where there's no evidence, obviously, where Boris Johnson's been caught on TV uh, lying, base, you know, not basically, but lying, you know, when this Port and Down lab uh, director was on TV two weeks later contradicting what Johnson said. And Johnson didn't just say it was Russia. He said this Port and Down director told him it was Russia. Then the port and down guy comes on two weeks later and says, we don't know where it's from. And again, this is a case, I think, of, of basically it's the MI6. They gave this guy some kind of, you know, slight, mild toxin. He may even be playing along. Sri Paul may still be an MI6, I mean, M16 agent. And they're just now the CIA is going to give him, a, you know, uh, basically diplomatic immunity in America, bring him to the United States. And that was part of the deal. I'm sure here, take this mild, you know, toxin, whatever, go to sleep for a while. We won't let anybody take pictures of you in the hospital. You know, so there's no pictures of these people in the hospital. And then when we're all done playing this game and blaming Russia, um, we'll go. In addition to that, Trump initially was the only Western world leader who didn't jump on the bandwagon and say, yeah, it was Russia. He actually said, we have to look at the evidence. Imagine that. Meanwhile, U.S. Congress, both parties howling for Russia's head, Putin's head, the French, you know, the Germans, NATO, everybody. But Trump held back. So what do they do? They come out with this porn star on 60 Minutes. And the next day, uh, all the niceties are gone. Uh, the, you know, the Twitter congratulations to Putin, which received just people were just enraged by that. All these politically correct uh, liberals, politi- you know, wanting to go to war just enraged by that. They're enraged by the fact that he actually invited Putin to a meeting at the White House. Okay, so there's this. So then, what, two days ago, or yesterday, actually, here we go with the sarin gas attack again, and Assad, and they just mopped up Eastern Ghouta, Assad, the Russians, Iran, Hezbollah, just basically liberated Eastern Ghouta from these MI6 terrorists, M16 terrorists, and here we go again, the sarin gas story, the old sarin gas serenade. And and again, Trump last week, what did he say? He said, we're thinking about getting out of Syria. So what did we have yesterday? We had the FBI raiding Trump's uh, attorney's office. 
This is how it works. Trump's just a punching bag. He's easy to be a punching bag because he's a very dislikable person. And everybody, not, not many people like him in the right mind. And so you get a guy in there with these Panamas, these dark stains on his past, and there's many, and use them against him. And you say, look, you either go to war, Bolton's in there now, Pompeo, they're saying, and they're yeah. the neocons. They represent the Rothschild banking interest in the city of London, which, by the way, would love nothing better for America and Russia to be enemies because they sit in the middle and they don't ever want those two countries to be friends because, God forbid, maybe we'd actually, you know, get out from under the thumb of the of the of the crown. And what's funny is, you know, there's this other this other myth when the Iraq war happened, you know, Tony Blair is a poodle. No, Americans are the poodle. George Bush was the poodle. You see, that's just another lie. That's just another piece of disinformation where they want you to believe that somehow the CIA was calling the shots, but they weren't. The MI6 was calling the shots. They usually use Mossad as their surrogate because Mossad in Israel is basically a Rothschild entity, a Rothschild intelligence service. And you have the same situation with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, where Cambridge Analytica, I think, is a British intelligence front, that interfered in over 200 elections, and then used Facebook to elect Trump. Why would they want to elect Trump? Oh, because then they can put Hillary and the deep state crowd, the CIA crowd, in the opposition, and they can push for war, and Trump can be the perfect punching bag. All the while, Trump's the foil and Russia's the target. And all the liberals hate Trump. So they don't even realize that they're they're marching us to war. They're marching America to war. For who? For the same people we went to war with in World War One and World War Two, and that would be the Rothschild banking interests in the city of London. This is really powerful stuff, Dean, because obviously I've hammered the bejesus out of Trump for a long time. Yeah. But Me too. And you too. But I understand the the dots that you're connecting. And that mm. I, I really do get, you know, that Trump was chosen for those reasons, regardless of what Trump might think personally about these issues. And it's interesting you mentioned that he did talk about, you know, he, he talked a lot, obviously, in the campaign about non-interventionism policies. But, but he, did, he did allude to a week ago, as you said, you know, rolling back on Syria. And then we had the Stormy Daniels stuff, as you said there. And that's why they choose these people, because they choose them because... They've not been very good boys. They've not been altar boys or, you know, good Catholics in their in their lives, and they are leveraged up to the uh, up to the hilt, and they can effectively control them. Do you know what I'm very interested in? All of that, of course. But what you said a minute ago, because it kind of embarrasses me. You talked about Sergei Skripal, and you said he might even be part of the operation. I'm going to be absolutely honest and say I'm ashamed. That scenario didn't occur to me. Maybe it's tiredness. It never occurred to me that somebody would... Have, no, honest to God, some, some of the listeners say, Richie's very naive. It never actually occurred to me that somebody would have tapped Skripal on the shoulder and said, hey, Sergey, do you want to get back in the game for a few days or a few weeks, you know? Jesus, Dean, yeah. you've, you've knocked me flat out there because I didn't consider that Skripal might have been involved in it. Why didn't well, I? You're right. Yeah. Maybe he yeah, was. Well, yeah, their, their lies, it's just a steady stream of lies and the lies are so big that it, it's just hard for people to take it in such a different direction because they're all the while they're hurting our thoughts in one direction, one direction. And, and you, you out, yeah, you do. You just, and, and I didn't come up with that on my own either, by the way, I was naive to it till a couple of days ago and I heard crosstalk on RT and some guys were bringing this up, Mark Sloboda and some guys. So it's not like some original thought I had either. And I felt stupid at that time too. Like, why didn't I think of that? But actually they didn't say he was still working for M MI6. That is my own original thought, but they did say that he was put under maybe by some mild fish talks. And I think there was a, a moon of Alabama blog is where Sloboda said he got that. So he didn't, it was not original to him. This is just the nature of information. I mean, nobody has an original thought. We all just have this collective consciousness, and we have to, we have to, we have to work it out. We have to work it out. But we have to continue to use our own minds. And and basically, everything these the Western media tells us, whether it's newspaper or, or 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 TV or anything, you just have to know that it's a lie. You have to know that, and you have to know it's a war. That we're at war. That these people have declared war on us. And, and not only with World War III scenario they're trying to set up, but with GMO foods and with, you know, toxic water and, and chemtrails and all kinds of stuff. But they've declared war on us. So, so you have to know that they're they're your enemy. I mean, you have to know they're, they're your enemy. And I know you do, Richie, but yeah. everybody out there, you just have to know this. And so every time you read something or, or hear something these people say, just know it's a lie. I've just been scared. That's that simple. 
I've I've been, I'm going to be honest. I I've been somewhat scared, not for me, but for other people. You know, as a broadcaster, you have a responsibility, and and you're an excellent writer, and you 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 um had, you know, a stint in politics, and you know that while you should never censor yourself, you do have a responsibility in terms of what you might influence people. And I've been reluctant until lately to use terminology like that, they're the enemy, for fear that somebody might be listening to the programme and they might be really having a bad time of it. And then they might physically assault somebody. They might meet one of their local councillors or, you know, and and, and and I don't want that to happen. No, but you're neither. right, Dean. They are the enemy. They represent a clear and present danger to our health, to our well-being and to our prosperity. I just must must mention this, by the way. As Dean is talking, we've got Dean Henderson on the line. It's interesting, Dean, that I, 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 I'm I never right, Dean. Whenever I make a prediction, it's always wrong. But I got one right yesterday. I was talking about the the, the Russian general, Sergei Rudsky, who on, Pat, on St. Patrick's Day said that the Americans had given chlorine gas to Syrian rebels that mm-hmm. would be used in a false flag attack. So the Russians predicted this several weeks ago. Jokingly, I suggested on the show this week that the that Russia's enemies would say, oh, that was a basic instinct ploy, Sharon Stone. You know, I'd have to be pretty stupid to write about killing somebody in my book and then kill somebody in the exact same way that I described in my book. And that's exactly what they were doing today. They were saying, oh, that was brilliant by the Russians three weeks ago to say, oh, a load of chlorine gas has been given to the rebels. So that would cover the Russians. So they're trying to blame the Russians for doing it. It's, it's, yeah. it's crazy, Dean. Yeah. What, what are we going to do about it, Dean? Well, we just have to continue to, to counter their lies. And what I try to do as a writer is, is get out in front of these stories before before the mainstream media works it over. Um, I wrote a column on uh, March 14th called Russian Deaths and an MI6 False Flag. I have no evidence of that at that time. I still have no evidence of that. But the way I look at it, Richie, you know, if Boris Johnson could go around throwing uh, accusations at the Russians with no evidence, then I can go ahead and I can go with my gut anyway and say it is based on history. I mean, the guy's 66. She's 33. You know, it has all the markings of a ritual kind of Illuminati thing. Um, it's the same pattern of, of, you know, with the Litvinenko poisoning, Alexander Litvinenko, who was also a double agent turned to, to British agent. And, his, you know, his own father, Walter, um, says that Russia was not behind his death right. to this day. Uh, there's also Berezhovsky died mysteriously. Um, there was there's Glushkov, this other guy that died at the same time. The Shripals, nobody's even talking about that. But he was another uh, one of the Russian oligarchs that Putin had kicked out of Russia. And to my mind, Glushkov and Berezhovsky, they probably just, you know, they knew too much and they were maybe going senile and they were in on the game. I mean, they were part of the rape of Russia. You know, let's not forget in 1999, the uh, Goldman Sachs boys went into Russia and by the time they were done with uh, using their drunken uh, puppet Yeltsin, they had uh, given over all, most of the oil reserves in Russia to the four horsemen so that those four companies, Exxon Mobil, Royal Dutch Shell, uh, BP Amico and Chevron Texaco literally doubled their asset value in 1999 with the with the takeover of those assets in in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, in Uzbekistan, in all the stands in the the countries that we basically lopped off of the Soviet Union, you know, and and that's that Central Asia area, and that's the grand chessboard, and that's still the game, and that's why it looks to me like Pompeo and Bolton, you know, they're neocons. They were with Project for a New American Century. These guys are Wolfowitz and Pearl yeah. uh, protégés. They are, they were, you know, Pearl and Wolfowitz dual Israeli citizens. Um, and so this is their plan. They, you know, let's go wreck the Middle East. And they've done it. Syria, Libya, Iraq, on and on, Afghanistan. And now they want to do Iran. And they really, I think, might be that naive that they actually think they can do that. And let me tell you, my friend, if that comes up, it's going to be really possibly the end of Western civilization, because I don't have any doubt that the Russian, Chinese, Iranian alliance would just kick the ass of these city of London bankers and their little mercenary armies. It's interesting you say that because Paul Craig Roberts is writing today, mutual friend of ours, and somebody I have a lot of time for, Paul. I don't always agree with Paul, but I, I, I always enjoy speaking with him. 
Uh, Paul yeah. is very reluctant. Not it's not that he's reluctant, but he doesn't see the Rothschild Rockefeller Warburg uh, dynasty mm-hmm. connection. He doesn't see that, and I genuinely believe he doesn't see that. Paul is not yeah. he's not scared of anything. But Paul reckons yeah. that with Trump not going to Latin America today, with him being surrounded by the the people you mentioned already, of course, Bolton being very significant here that we might be on the brink, Dean. And I, I genuinely yeah. don't like to be talking about stuff like this and fear-mongering because fear porn yeah. does sell. But we are on the brink. Are we as close to conflict with Russia? Are we as close as we've been since the Cuban Missile Crisis? Or is that just sensationalism? No, I don't think it is, Richie. And I'm the same way. I don't I don't come up with these, you know, I don't try to write sensationalist, you know, articles and headlines just to get you know, get press or whatever, but because it is, there's a lot of people out there that do that. Half of them are, are, are working for the CIA, you know, trying to scare people with these fake scenarios that aren't going to happen. My last article, which I wrote the 27th of March, or I guess second to last was called Rothschild's March to World War III. And that's exactly what I think this is. That's what Russiagate was. It was a, an attempt to pressure, put the pressure, put the pressure. That's what the street ball thing is. That's, you know, that's what the whole thing in Syria. So I think it's going to start. They want it to start in the Middle East. I mean, they want it to start. I, I see a scenario where they're going to pick on the weakest link possible that's left. And that would be Hezbollah in Lebanon. So I still would watch for something to be cooked up there. And then they'll see if Iran intervenes, if Israel intervenes, and then it could go from there. But I, I mean, it really just looks to me like they're just not going to let up on Trump until he does what they want. And it just seems to be what they want. And I think the reason they want it, again, it's part of their econometric modeling. And they know that there's these huge bubbles in real estate, huge bubble in uh, the Wall Street, you yeah, know, and yeah. huge, huge bubble in the bond market. There's bubbles everywhere you look, man. And there's, you know, people are in debt, they're in hock, and they don't want to just deflate the thing and and let the air come out by itself and, and slow the economy down. They have to have this growth. They're just, you know, they have to, they have to make more billions, you know, and, all, and the best way, of course, they do that is with their war machine and their military industrial complex, which is what we're talking about. But I would call it more of a banker military complex because, you know, it's a given that they own the industrial part anyway. So let's call it what it is. It's a banker, banker military complex and the bankers make money off of war. And as I said before, it's the same situation where, you know, back during uh, World War One, it was Jack Morgan, uh, J.P. Morgan's son, who basically lobbied and lobbied uh, along with the Carnegie uh, Institute for Peace, you know, to basically get the United States involved in World War One on the side of who? The city of London. Then World War Two comes. And then, the, and then, of course, the Morgans sold arms uh, and made a lot of money. World War Two comes around. Same situation. And you have a, a false flag at Pearl Harbor where the United States took all of its uh, planes and expensive military equipment out of Pearl Harbor before the Japanese bombed it. They knew they were going to bomb it. They were, they, they were told by several different countries that that was going to happen. And this was an attempt by Winston Churchill and the Crown to get America to come fight their war against Hitler for them. Before the Pearl Harbor false flag, 85 percent of Americans didn't want to go into World War II. After Pearl Harbor, it was just about the exact opposite. Eighty-five percent wanted to go, and we went. And yeah, Hitler was a bad guy. He was created by the city of London too. But uh, we never, we shouldn't have went, and we shouldn't have went in World War One, and we shouldn't go this time. And it's about time the United States, American people, realize what's going on, which is that we're a Hessianized mercenary colony for the city of London. We pay for the wars. Americans do. We go in debt. Twenty-four trillion dollar debt. Our boys die. Uh, the first oil contract in Iraq, who did it go to? British Petroleum. That's right. The second one, Royal Dutch Shell. No bait. Entities. And, and it, is time, it is high time we quit being basically serfs and mercenaries for these people who are just unscrupulous uh, beyond what you could believe. They will, they're devils. They will, they will tell lies. And they, and they do tell lies every single day to accomplish their agenda. No bid contracts as well, those contracts. Let me just remind our listeners, um, the um, the geopolitical analyst, the author, and the former Democratic congressional candidate, Dean Henderson, my friend, 
is live on the line from Missouri. Uh, it's great to have Dean back on the program. Um, check out um, Dean's. Uh, I, I'm going to tweet it out, by the way. Uh, Dean's um, website. It's hendersonlefthook.wordpress.com. Links there to Dean's book as well. Fascinating that the cabal would choose Trump because Trump was a completely eccentric, completely one-off, his opinions were his own, a bit mad, Mm -hmm. a bit of a playboy, that they would choose him specifically because he had said so much about not wanting to carry on interventionism so that they could easier sell these wars by coercing him. It would be easier to do that and sell it to the public than it would have been through the criminal Clinton cartel, which people were absolutely sick of. That's a really fascinating scenario. Here's a question for you now. I don't know if if if, if you will have come across this, Dean, but the Skripal story, when it emerged, the man who was put out to bat by the by by the psychopaths, let's call them that, was a guy mm. called Tom Tugentat. Now he's a member of Parliament. And he's a very new member of parliament. He won his seat in the last election. But he's also a former military officer. And what was really extraordinary about Tom Tugendhat was he, he's a big fan of Israel. And he'd written articles for various magazines about Israel and about Israel being right and Israel is this and Israel is that. He was only an MP a very short time. We're talking literally only a few months. And all of a sudden... He was given the job of chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. That's the Parliamentary Foreign Affairs Committee. An extraordinary success for such a new member of Parliament. The previous chairman had been forced out because he'd written a very negative report about Libya. A brilliant report describing the Libyan intervention as, you know, as basically fraudulent, um, illegal and all of that. So this guy gets this really prestigious job out of nowhere and he's a military officer and he was put out on the television every day to say that the Skripals were poisoned by Russia. Wait for this, Dean. Wait for this. Today, a member of parliament from Plymouth, which is on the south coast, a guy called Johnny Mercer, Mercer has been sent onto every television and radio station today to promote intervention in Syria. Mercer is a former army officer. We're seeing a lot of former army officers getting seats in Parliament, and I'm thinking Smedley Butler. Is there some sort of coup going on, Dean? Military guys, not not yeah. not, not soldiers now, not poor grunts who you know had to suffer, uh, you know, in wars. But officers are getting. Not only are they getting jobs in winning seats in Parliament, but they're also getting prestigious jobs like heading up the Foreign Affairs Committee. What do you think? Well, that's really interesting, Richie, because the same thing is happening. Um, there was an excellent article on the World Socialist uh, website. Uh, Patrick Walker wrote it, I think, and he was talking about how there's all these ex-military, ex-CIA, supposedly ex-CIA people running in the Democratic Party in the United States this election cycle. And, you know, in November, we have uh, midterm elections this year. And he said there, you just could not, he named many, many names. And, and, and it's just amazing. But again, it's this deep state being on the sort, in the opposition so that they can put the screws to Trump and make fun of him and make him look bad and then control him when he doesn't do what they want. And so it's very possible that they're working up to that as a contingency. I mean, I think as long as Trump, you know, if he bombs Syria tomorrow, the FBI raid, it'll go away. They won't make another word about it. But if he doesn't, then they're going to dig into some more stuff and threaten him with some more stuff. Maybe there'll be another uh, porn star, you know, or maybe there'll be another whatever. But that's just how it works. So they just it's a turning of the screws. And, and they and again, they know the guys, you know, very unlikable. Um, but I think one thing is this, you know, he, they got him in there to take care of their economic policies. And they knew he would because he's a definite you know, right winger to the max and, you know, cut corporate taxes and all this kind of stuff. But they knew that his military, his foreign policy was a little bit too friendly, maybe a little bit too much to do with diplomacy. And Clinton was just the opposite. Her programs, you know, there probably would have been some more clean air regulations, clean, whatever, regulate, cost the corporations some money. There wouldn't have been a corporate tax cut. So in a way, Trump was really better you know, to serve them as long as they could rein in uh, his foreign policy or not necessarily, I shouldn't say rein it in, I should say turn it loose because <laughs> yeah, he would yeah. like to rein it in and they want to turn it loose some more. 
So I, I think that's the situation. But I have no doubt. Uh, interesting that that's going on in Britain with these military people uh, getting into your parliament, because the same situation seems to be occurring here in the United States uh, in the Democratic Party, I'm told, mostly in the run up to this election. So I think there there's always a contingency plan. Again, you know, that's what happened with Kennedy. He you know, John F. Kennedy was the last president we had who who gave really any hope of ending this uh serfdom to the bankers and when he started a new currency system based on silver um that's when they assassinated him it wasn't you know that he wasn't aggressive enough with cuba it wasn't that he wasn't you know enough of a hawk in vietnam but it was actually that he was going to start a silver based and he did start a silver based currency issued by the treasury department not by a private banking cartel and that's when he was killed and so you know, and before that, of course, they 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 screwed. They they tried to do the same to him, Marilyn Monroe, and all his affairs. Yeah, and trips, his brother, and tried yeah. to discredit him in many many ways. And when that didn't work, and he finally, you know, he said he was going to blow the CIA into a million pieces. <laughs> I mean, he talked about the Freemasons. He talked about secret society. He talked about a lot of things that me and you talk about. And you know, now it's a conspiracy theory. Well, back then, our president was talking about it. hell. Hell, hell. I mean, you go back to Thomas Jefferson and uh, George Washington that were using the word Illuminati. I mean. That's the thing, you know, people don't realize the long, long, long history of, of just serfdom to these bankers that the whole world has had to endure. And it's just time to put an end to it. And the only way we're going to do it is go to the head of the snake, which is the city of London bankers, the Wall Street bankers. And we just got to nationalize them. We just got to throw them in jail. We just I mean, it's not that hard to do. It's just getting people getting their heads turned around to where they're not interested in listening to a porn star, what she has to say about Trump. And they're more interested maybe in bigger issues like, you know, nationalizing the Federal Reserve. And the Bank of England and, and taking back our money system and ending this debt slavery to these bankers. That's right. And this is and, and this is the crux of everything. And again, the basis yeah. for Dean's books, by the way, um, Henderson left hook dot wordpress dot com. Nobody has written more and in uh, nobody has written in greater depth about the financial system put in place by these elites to keep total control of everything. Nobody's done more on that than Dean Henderson. I'm telling you, folks, check him out. So, Dean, what we're seeing then is, and what we have seen in recent months here in the UK, we've seen what on the face of it appears to be an attack on Jeremy Corbyn and on the mm. Labour Party. Now, I say on the face of it because to Corbyn's supporters, it looks very real. It looks that, oh, they're terrified of Jeremy. They're terrified of him. That's why they're making up all these stories of anti-Semitism. I don't believe they're terrified of Jeremy. Jeremy, they don't care who's in. As long as people are voting for somebody, they don't care. What they're doing with this Corbyn thing is they're they, they're trying to criminalise not just criticism of Israel, but any discussion that leads to that leads to unveiling, as it were, yeah. these financial institutions, their history, who's been be, you know who's behind them these families because that's where it goes that's where the yellow brick road ultimately ends up and all this anti-semitism garbage dean is really yeah. about completely closing off any avenues to discussing the financial elites yeah. talk to us about that because i'm convinced of that it's not about corbyn it's about yeah. much deeper than that go ahead no it's a brilliant take on it and uh, i think you're absolutely right I, you know you can criticize the the cia and, and the nsa and they might monitor your phone and tap your internet. You, if you criticize the Mossad, um, it gets a little more serious again because you're following that yellow brick road, and uh, and then they'll call you an anti-Semite. But if you criticize British intelligence, they'll try to kill you, like they've done to me twice. And that's this is. I, but I, every article I write, and that's what I'm writing about because we have to take that yellow brick road, Richie. We have to take it all the way to the end. We don't have much time. We don't have much time. And you're exactly right. Corbyn painted as an anti-Semite by a bunch of paid Mossad agents out in the streets of Israel wearing their yarmulkes and whatever. And all for what? Some acquaintance of his that did some graffiti that he doesn't even really know. And again, just reinforcing and dampen down any criticism of Israel, any criticism of uh, who owns Israel. Because I have no doubt that the Mossad was involved with the, the Shripal thing, too. They probably did the dirty work they always do, if there was dirty work, if he didn't just go along with it. Um, they're like the next in line, and they, and they really are serving the crown. And, and let's remember who created Israel, you know, it was the Balfour Declaration, which was 
You know, the Rothschild family created Israel. They're known as the fathers of Israel. And if you say Rothschilds, a lot, even if you say Rothschilds, a lot of people just call you an anti-Semite. I had a yeah. woman do it to me the other day. I said, what about if you criticize George Bush? Does that mean I'm anti-Christian? Yeah, what about exactly. if I criticize Saudi Arabia? Yeah. Am, I, am I a Muslim hater? Yeah. What if I criticize Burma? Am I an anti-Buddhist? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. But again, they've set that all up. To, to tamp down anybody that's going down that yellow brick road. And most people, they get to that Israel part and they turn back. But if you keep going, you're going to find out who's behind Israel. And you're going to find out it's the Rothschilds and the city of London bankers. And that those are the people who own every central bank in the world, along with the Warburgs, the Rockefellers, the Kuhn Loeb's, the Goldman Sachs, Interbred, all of them. There's really just one family all together now. And, and, and that's where they don't want you to go. But that is exactly where we need to go. It is, it is the crux of the matter. And until we, we're willing to go there in mass, I'm afraid nothing in this world is going to change because these same people are just going to tell another lie the very next day, create another conflict, another false flag, another pretext to carry out their agenda. Because they're just, uh, they're probably just lizards, let's face it. Dean, that makes is, more sense to me. I, I, well, you know, and obviously that's a theme that we've discussed so often on this program over the years. They're the genesis of these people, the entities that might be worshipped by these people, who they're in contact with. I, I'm, I'm wide open to that, obviously, because of yeah. my past associations. So, you, so these Agenda 2130, depopulation is definitely on the agenda for these people. So when we, and, and it does give us sleepless nights at times thinking about, well, what if they pushed a country to the brink of launching a, a, a nuclear device, which could in turn provoke another country in retaliation to launch a nuclear device, and maybe hundreds of millions might be killed. We do sometimes lose sleep over that, or spend hours sitting there thinking about it, dreading it. But these people might be looking forward to it. Yeah. And, and, it, and even that scenario, that threat of nuclear war hung over our heads is a, actually just another distraction. Yeah, they'll make money on it, the bankers, so there's, there's that. But it's also a way to keep us from talking about the bankers. Let's talk yeah. about the bankers. No, we got to talk about a prostitute or a porn star. Oh, well, we can go up the ladder a little bit and we can talk about going to war with North Korea. But it, it doesn't matter if we just don't talk about who's creating these wars, who's paying these people, who's controlling Trump and Clinton and Theresa May and all these leaders. And, and we have to just get to the head of the snake and we have to cut it off. Did they know, Dean, uh, this is a question I might have asked you before. Dean Henderson is our guest, by the way, if you've just tuned in late. It's hendersonlefthook.wordpress.com. Uh, do make a bookmark on your toolbar on your homepage there of Dean's website. Check him out and do read his books if you haven't before. Do you think the likes of how much, I mean, let's talk, well, what, when speaking about how much do these puppets actually know, which is an infinitely interesting question. You yeah. can obviously talk about Trump because somebody said to Donald Trump, right, um, Donald, or Mr. President, if his superiors call him Mr. President, which I doubted, somebody said yeah. to him, right, Donald, you're having John Bolton as your national security advisor. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Trump would have went, what? Or presumably would have went, oh, well, anybody but him. And he was told, no, you're having him. So presumably Trump is aware of the fact that he might be on row or rung seven of the ladder and are seven levels above mm -hmm. him. How much do they know, Dean, these people? Well, yeah, that's a really great question and a great point because it is, it's all compartmentalized, just like the secret societies where there's different levels and just like the CIA and the MI6 and the Mossad, there's, it's all compartmentalized to where Every level only knows on a need-to-know basis, they call it, and that gives them uh, deniability, they call it. This is all intelligence parlance. Like, it gives them deniability. Well, I didn't know about it. Well, they really didn't know about it, you know, and, and they're not lying in most cases because it's all compartmentalized. I think Trump suspects that. I think, you know, the day he went into that meeting with Obama, and it was supposed to be, you know, a 10-minute meeting, you know, when they were doing the transfer of power, and it ended up being like an hour. He came out of it looking kind of shell-shocked. And I had the same thing happen with Jimmy Carter when he when he went to his meeting uh, to become president with uh, who would have been well Gerald Ford. Uh, he came out looking the same way, and uh, you know, people were talking about well they told him about the alien controllers or they told him about but they tell you certain things and they tell you to stay in line. I think is the bottom line, 
and they and, and I'm not sure that Trump has any idea about you know who it is that's above him. But yeah, you're absolutely right. This is how they control leaders: is advisors. They use the advisors. Um, all your national security advisors, all your presidential cabinet level advisors in the United States. If you look at where they came from, they will have either come from the Atlantic Council, which is the which is the group in the United States right now that's uh, that's basically march trying to march us to war with Russia more than any other. And it used to be the Atlantic Union, and it was founded by James Warburg back in the early 1900s. And it established an office uh, at a, in a Rockefeller-owned office building in New York City. And it's all about the special relationship between the Crown and the United States and us being the poodle in that relationship. And so the Atlantic Council, if you watch American TV, that's who's pushing uh, this whole Shripal lie here. Well, so it's them or it's the Council on Foreign Relations, which is the affiliate of the Royal Institute of International Affairs in your country, um, both controlled by the Rothschilds and the Crown, created by them um, out of the business roundtable back in the early 1900s. Cecil Rhodes and those boys, same time the Balfour Declaration came about, same time the Federal Reserve came about in 1913. Um, so or they come from maybe the Trilateral Commission, which is another one of these globalist uh New World Order, depopulation, Agenda 21, uh, you know, elitist banker groups founded by David Rockefeller, Zig Brzezinski, uh, the trilateral meaning including Japan, uh, Europe and North America. But it's good. They're going to come from one of those three outfits uh, or maybe the Heritage Foundation or but it's going to be one of the banker controlled and created uh, think tanks. And, and that so it's through the advisors that they really do influence. And I think that's why Trump has gotten rid of a lot of people. Because he smelled rats everywhere he turns. He's like, God, this guy. And so he's getting rid of him and they make fun of him for that. But I don't have a problem with that as long as he gets rid of him. But it's when he brings in Bolton and Pompeo, you know, the screws came down. You know, you know, uh, and the, again, this was right when they when the whole uh, thing happened with Stormy Daniels. And that was the screw that time, you know, and um, not to, it's <laughs> got a metaphor, but. Um, you know, I tell you, that's the way they do it. And, and these guys, all these, all these advisors come from these, these banker controlled, uh, places. And, and that's how they control these, these puppet presidents. And they're just puppets. And they, they, they kind of think that they know right off the bat, they're told, you know, that, Hey, this is how it's going to be, but they don't really know how high up it goes. It's all compartmentalized. Now you get to 33rd level masonry and then you become illuminated and it's the Illuminati. Um, there's 33 spines in our back. Okay, and that's where that comes from. And they think they're the head. They think they're smarter than us. They ate from the tree of knowledge, if you want to go biblical. And they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden for it. Okay. And they're 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 against God. They're fighting God every day. That's why they create GMO foods. That's why they do all these uh alchemistic uh bad things to the earth like mining, because they think that you know God didn't quite make creation right. We gotta we can make it better. We're smarter than him. And that's what that's where they call them the Illuminati, and that's not our term. They call themselves the Illuminati. The illuminated ones and that's where you, you you probably are in touch with aliens and then i even heard there's levels in the illuminati there's like seven levels of the illuminati but when you get way up to the top that's where you're going to be talking about aliens and that and and I, I sometimes wonder if aliens aren't satan i mean it's like any you know it's like alien to the earth okay just think about it that way if, if you're alien to mother earth and you're working against mother earth then you could you know that's what some religions have called satan you know devious deceptive uh arrogant with your knowledge or you know even though you don't really have any you're not you don't have any knowledge if you're like that you're an idiot but but you're not in tune with mother earth so therefore you're an alien you know and so i don't know what they are if they're entities or if it's just an energy that, that's tapped into or you know we gotta that's that's another one of these like things with did Shri paul go along with that you know and i think i think we gotta think out of the box on that one and try to figure that out but it's a whole nother show but um no, I think it's compartmentalized, and I think Trump knows there's people above him, but he doesn't know who, and and he he's just uh, kept in line through fear and through, yeah, you have to have Bolton, exactly. You have to have these certain advisors. Dean Henderson is our guest. Henderson, lefthook.wordpress.com. Left Dean, I've been listening to that intently, and while you were chatting there, you threw in the Council on Foreign Relations, one of the roundtable organisations, and that's headed up at the moment by a guy called Richard Haas. And he's absolutely right, Dean. This is a Rockefeller, Rothschild organisation. And this guy is obviously um, crazy. He's stone cold crazy, this Richard Haas. But I suppose there's method in their madness. I might just have a little bit of audio, Dean, 
which runs for a couple of minutes, not even a couple of minutes. I've played this on the programme before. Haas was speaking last year at a summit and he talked about something he called World Order 2.0, which was the future. And the future World Order 2.0 would be a world where national boundaries didn't mean anything anymore. Sovereignty didn't mean anything. That countries could come together and could operate in a third country if they felt like it, if they felt that their own interests were being harmed by that country. This is psychotic stuff, but it's the basis for a lot of what you've been writing about for years, what we've been talking about today. I've not had a chance to cue this up, so knowing me, Dean, this is going to be a total mess and I won't play this in the right place, but I'm going to have a pop. I'm going to have a go at it anyway. Let's, let's see if I got it in the right place. Very differently in the 21st century. And for the last few hundred years, order was pre premised on a very simple idea big idea and an innovation when it came up in the 17th century, but it's the idea that this is a world of nation states and that the organizing principle, the ordering principle be so will be sovereignty. And essentially states will not use force to change borders of other states and states will respect the borders of others, not just physically, but they'll respect it in a larger sense. They won't be interfering. They'll essentially leave what happens within other states to the, that country alone. It's kind of live and let live, hands off, Reality. And that was a big idea when it came around in the, the mid-17th century. It was obviously violated over the next 300 plus years, and it, but it's still a good idea. Saddam Hussein violated it when he went into Kuwait. It was a costly you know, decision. And again, Russia violated it uh, more recently. And we don't want to have a world where this is violated regularly. My argument in the book is that's all good. It's still necessary, but it's no longer sufficient. That if you live in a world of globalization, to make a long story short, nothing stays local for long. If you have computer hackers on your territory, they can cause mischief or worse all over the world. If you have a poultry farm that has unsanitary conditions, certain types of diseases can break out, human transmission, it can cause a global pandemic. If uh, you're India and you decide that your economy forces you to uh, generate a lot more electricity and the easiest way to do it is through coal, uh, this will have climate change consequences for everyone else uh, in the world, in addition to whatever environmental consequences it may have uh, for you. As we learned on 9-11, a few blocks from here, if a government uh, allows, or one way or another, through choice or weakness, terrorists operate out of its territory, those terrorists can cause havoc uh, halfway around the world. As we saw in Syria, if you have massive flows of refugees, it can destabilize other parts of the world, as we're now seeing in Europe. So my argument is simply, while we need to respect sovereignty and not, again, bring about a world where invasion is commonplace, we also now need to, to build on it. And my idea is that sovereign entities need to have the obligation to make sure that nothing is allowed to go on within their territorial limits that has adverse consequences for anybody else. Well, Dean, wonderful, isn't it? You could be doing something in your country that affects climate change. We might have to intervene. You could be allowing terrorists foster in your country. The sovereign borders come down. We should be able to intervene. He called that World Order 2.0. And you've written about how important roundtable institutions like the Council on Foreign Relations are because they tell, they take the orders from, uh, from, 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 the, from the bosses, don't they? And they yeah. give those orders to politicians effectively. Yeah, that's right. And the, the, of course, the council, CFR, puts out foreign affairs and every single congressman in the United States uh, subscribes to that, reads that. And that so pretty much State Department foreign policy comes from foreign affairs, comes from Council on Foreign Relations. And this doesn't this just sound just like U.S. foreign policy, this arrogant idea that we're so democratic, even though we cheated Bernie in the election, even though there, you know, but even though there's no democracy here and we are so pompous and sanctimonious that we, we have the right, but it's not, we, you see, it's just, they like to use our military yeah. and the, we again, where the CFR gets its orders is the bankers and the industrialists and the, the, the trillionaires, the people that, you know, the controllers, the controllers of this planet that are ruining all of us, ruining the planet along with it. And so we have to, again, climb up this, uh, climb down the yellow brick road, go down the yellow brick road and, and get to the head of this snake 
and we got to get people there. We got to get them up to speed on the on the depth of this uh, control because when you get to the end of it, it's really just simple. And there's just these handful of families, just like you thought when you were three or four years old. You were right. You know, we all kind of didn't you all have that uh, notion when you were a little kid that there was just a few people around the world. There must have yeah. been because everything you saw on TV was like, well, that's a lie. That's a lie. But then when you grow up, you're socialized into it. You're taught to accept it. If you don't accept it, you're branded, a, you know, an outsider and a rebel. And, you uh, know, they've got this thing now, you know, in the United States, they actually make up diseases like there's one called oppositional uh I can't remember, but if you're, you know, if you don't go out the program, they, they start giving you pills. <laughs> and so that's how it works. And, but the truth is, yeah, that's right. It's just like your gut told you when you're little and uh, your gut is where to stay. I mean, people are, people got to get out of their heads a little bit, uh, get out of the news cycle and go with their intuition. You know, we used to have a really good intuition and God gave us that creator gave us that. And you need to really count on that. Um, but of course you have to combine that with a, a sense of history. And uh, read a lot of history, uh, true history, not not lie history, because there's boy, there's way more of the latter. But um, but yeah, it's uh, that, that's just that that Richard Haas. I mean, it, to me, that just sounds so much like what uh, you know John Bolton would say, or what oh, Mickey, yeah. uh, what's her name would say at the UN about Russia. I mean, it's just so condescending and arrogant, and you know, we're the ones, we're the illuminated ones, and you're just, you know, wow. Yeah, so, we, we might see something going on in your country that we say adversely yeah. affects us so we can we yeah. can come in. We've got about um, 45 seconds left, Dean. And sorry for using 90 seconds, but I wanted to put that audio in because it, it supported yeah. what you were saying. Mm-hmm. Dean's mm-hmm. website is hendersonlefthook.wordpress.com. Subscribe to the Left Hook column. It's free. And again, there aren't too many people rationally and calmly and academically putting together this information in the way that Dean is doing it. I absolutely endorse it, so I reckon I recommend you check it out. You have the last 45 seconds, Dean. Give us give us a bit of light at the end of the tunnel there. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Well, hey, thanks so much, Richie. Uh, you just are so nice to me, and uh, you say the nicest things, and I don't deserve it really, but yeah, I can say <laughs> the same about you, and I will, because you do a hell of a job, and you really do an important thing what you're doing. Uh, and uh, we, we just... Uh, I'm, I'm honored to have you as a, as a comrade and brother in this fight. Um, and everybody just, you know, you got to keep your head up. You got to, despite all the negative news, you know, uh, you really have to remember that, that you know, it's a beautiful world that uh, the that, that, that creator or God or whatever your God, you could just put an O in there and call it good for all I care. I don't really care what your God or your good is as long as it's good. But whatever it was created a beautiful world. And these malevolent aliens, uh, they're alien to this world. They're alien to, to, to justice and truth and love. They're full of hate. Don't become like them in this fight. You have to stay above it. You have to criticize it, critique it. And I really think in the end, love and anger are the same thing, but you have to direct the anger appropriately. But you can't really love without being angry. I mean, Che Guevara left a you know, middle-class life in Argentina where he could have been a doctor and went and helped the people of Cuba free themselves and then died, was hunted down by the CIA in Bolivia. There was a lot of love there and there was a lot of courage there. They're the same thing. And don't let the – this is another lie of theirs where, you know, oh, you're too angry or, oh, you're too focused, you're a hippie, you're too focused on love. It's the same thing. You can't love without being angry about this stuff, and you can't be angry without being full of love. So don't be a robot. Don't be afraid to, to express yourself and be, be passionate and keep positive in the big picture because we have to because uh, this is all designed to generate this dark energy, and they use this dark energy to take us into these war situations and keep concealed uh, the real controllers of this planet. So it's all got to be seen as one. We're all one. We're all one big family. We're all connected. We're connected to the earth, the rocks, the plants, the animals. And for, for the sake of all, let's continue this struggle. Henderson left hook.wordpress.com. Check out Dean Henderson if you haven't before. I know that many of our listeners would have connected with Dean before. Dean, thanks, and let's pick this up again in uh, only a few weeks' time. Let's pick it up again next month when you have some time. Thanks, mate. Sounds great, Richie. Thanks so much for having me. Anytime. It's an honour. Dean Henderson, hendersonlefthook.wordpress.com. Check him out. Excellently briefed and researched analysis of what's going on. Uh, Don't miss Dean. Bookmark his website there.